Hello, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to The Dan Nessel Show. I'm your host, Dan Nessel. You know, today I've got a show for you that has a little bit of everything, at least everything that happens to be in my universe. We're going to be talking about Japan. We're going to be talking about social media, social media in Japan. We'll be talking about influence and influencer marketing, some podcasting, podcaster tips, everything that pretty much I'm concerned with these days. And the reason we're doing this is because my guest is probably the most qualified person that I know to have this conversation with me my longtime friend, my co-Japan expert, author of Age of Influence, and one hell of a karaoke singer, Mr. Neil Schaefer. Neil and I had a lot of fun doing this podcast, and I'm absolutely sure that you're going to have a lot of fun listening to it too. But one thing I can guarantee you is that you're going to hear a side of Neil Schaefer that you've never heard before. I'm not going to say any more than that. You'll get to it soon enough. And without further ado, let's get into it. I can't believe it. I'm here with Neil Schaefer. This is like a dream come true. How you doing, man? I can't believe I'm here with Dan Nestle on his <laughs> podcast. This is my dream come true. You know, it's funny you said that because we were talking about this, you know, year, two years ago. We were talking about it a year ago, six months ago. Um, and um, my listeners will know, and, and I'm sure, you, and of course, you know, that uh, it took me a real long time to push the button and get this thing going. But now that I got it going, I can't stop. Love it. I'm having a great time with this podcast. But Neil was one of the first people, everybody out there, Neil was one of the very first people I ever talked about to about doing this because let's face it, he's Neil Schaefer. Neil Schaefer, consistently in the top 50 of social media influencers, a best-selling author. He's a guy who knows this business. And more than that, he's a guy that I know and knows me. And uh, we go back, we're friends. I've always appreciated his advice. And um, to have him on the show, even though he threatened to, to be on my show, he immediately accepted my invitation years ago when I said I was going to do it. Um, I should have taken him at his word, but um, here he is, the man, the myth, the legend, Neil Schaefer. How are you doing these days, man? Um, wow, that was, that was way too much, bro. Uh, oh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get worse. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm, in gush, I'm in full gush mode. No, I'm doing great. I've, man, we've known each other for like a decade. I'm trying to remember yeah. that windmill networking in New York event like in That's Manhattan. That's what you did some random like bar inside a hotel, I think. And uh, yeah. That's exactly um, right. I had just come back from Japan. Um, that was and, the connection. Um, Japan via, via Australia, actually. And that was the connection. So I, I, I'd been networking for, by that point, for almost 10 years. Um, we were, you know, as an early adopter on LinkedIn um, from 2003 or something like that. And, you know, I was involved with all kinds of social networks and I come across profiles, this guy who's like doing some really cool blogging and some writing and really going for it. Like a guy who is like, is actually going for a career or building a business in this new and exciting space of social media. And um, he wrote a book called uh, Windmill Networking. You know, I reached out, we connected on LinkedIn. Turns out, holy crap, this guy's been in Japan for like however many years. <laughs> and everybody knows, of course, I lived in Japan for 15, 16 years. I'm like, this is too, un this is uncanny. Like in the whole world of people networking, why would I reach out to the one guy who, who I never met who happened to live in Japan around the same time I did? Um, and then we meet at that random hotel in New York with there's about 30 or 40 people there, Yeah. right? I think I brought my friend Scott Milano with me. And, um, you know, I had just been back from them. Like, I gotta meet this guy, Neil. We gotta meet this guy, Neil. I've never met him face to face, but man, I feel like I know him. So we meet face to face and it was exactly like I knew you. And that was the beauty of it. We'd been connecting so long. That whole Japan connection, I mean, let's, let's run through the litany of the ways that, that we are connected that make none of this surprising, but all of it amazing. We're both we Japan guys. Yep. But you were in Osaka? I was in, Osaka, I was in Kansai for 15 years. Yeah. And I was in the southern part of Kansai for three and then in Tokyo for, tw for, for another 13. Um, and... Uh, we, uh, we both have, some, somewhere along the way, we got married to Japanese wives, right? Hi. Hi. We both have kids that are basically the same age. Mine are 14 and 16. 15 and, and 13. 15 and 13. Bilingual, so right. boom, boom, boom. We've both been to, bilingual, we both uh, visited uh, KO New York, right? Both did that. <laughs> um, we, have, uh, we have met in New York. We've met in Tokyo. 
We've met in San Diego. We've met, you know, in many, multiple locations across the world. And there's a lot of places where we were going to meet, but we have we weren't able to. And we met in 2020. I mean, that's the Did. year that, yeah. I mean, right before this all started. I mean, it had started, but. Neil was one of the last people that I saw outside of my family um, at Social Media Marketing World in March. That last night. That last night. There, yeah. Thanks to uh, Todd Grossman, Talk Walker, shout out. Yeah, um, that's great. You know, we, um, we had our, our, a really great dinner in San Diego um, between fist bumps and elbow, you know, things and, uh, and a lot of hand sanitizer, but nobody knew what was going on, right? Like, nobody knew that we had that COVID-19 was really a thing until like five days later when the entire country shut down. Yeah, and we didn't know it was airborne, that's for sure, so. Yeah, <laughs> but we were lucky, I suppose, uh, yeah. and got to hang out. And at that time, I even told Neil, I was thinking about the podcast. He's like, why don't you just do it? Yeah, so, yeah, man. I count him among the number of people who have who have been um, really forcibly, but kindly. Can I, can we do both those th- at the same time? Can you be a kindly, kind forcing person? I don't know, but you've been very influential in the way that you've helped me to sort of uh, see that I had this in me and I had this creative spark in me and I should go for it. You and know? you forgot, I thought one of the original things you were gonna do with this podcast, and I mean, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing now, but you were going to include this music element, right? Because you're, yeah. that's the other thing that, and it's funny because I'm literally, and I'm starting to post about this on Instagram, I'm literally going through, I have hundreds of CDs. I'm literally alphabetizing them and going through them one by one and doing a Marie Kondo. Does this make me happy or not? Does this, is this still relevant to my life today, this music? Some is, some I'm going in and finding on Discogs and other sites that, wow, they, they have a new like live album out of, of like outtakes and I'm actually buying more CDs and others it's like, you know what? I don't know why I picked up the CD 10 years ago. I think I'm going to sell it off at the used CD store. So I'm, on, I'm actually up to letter P now. I was just listening to uh, The Pretenders and The Primitives. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, so, yeah, so, so music is like a really important part of my life. In fact, work from home, I've listened to more music during work than I think I ever have. So I and thought maybe it, that would be a good place to, to start today. It is. In fact, one of the original ideas was for me, I want to talk with two professionals who have this kind of sideline or or have a background in music. And it turns out a lot of people do. Mm-hmm. And maybe I'll get there someday. But the first, per, one of the first people I talked about was Neil. And Neil's a drummer. Um, I'm a trumpet player. Now, if you think that I'm telegraphing him picking up the, the drums and me playing the trumpet here on the podcast, you're wrong. You're mistaken. But um, I did think, Neil, and I don't know if you're ready for this, but I did think that people here in the States or actually whoever, wherever you're listening to this podcast, um, karaoke is a thing, right? Karaoke, mm-hmm. karaoke. Mm-hmm. And um, it takes a lot of alcohol and people get up on stage and you, you, know, you, uh, you sing in front of a lot of people. Well, in Japan, a little bit different, right? That's the way it started though. When I, went, when yeah. I first went to Japan and I did my junior abroad in Beijing, and my roommate was Japanese. So on my way back between junior and senior year, I was in Tokyo. And at the time, 1989, 1990, 1991, before you had karaoke boxu, mm-hmm. that was the way it was. And that's the way it's known in oh, America, right? The laser discs. Well, yeah, exactly. So you were disc. on a stage in front of people, a lot of people you didn't know. And yeah, yeah quite intimidating. Now with the, with the box, which I think started getting popular like in the, in the early 90s, mm-hmm. that, but you don't see that here in the States. But That's yeah, right. it, it's, it, it's very different when you're up on a stage in front of people you don't know. Right. And, <laughs> and the great thing about, you know, once you're in Japan, especially like, I don't know what it was like for you in Osaka, but when I first lived in Japan, it was, I, I didn't go to karaoke box, but I had these local bars that I would go to. Right. Everything happens in a bar. Everything. Of and when you're an expat, especially, um, I went to these particular bars and I was the only non-Japanese person there. So, you know, naturally they'd be like, Oh, you, you're non-Japanese. You so sing some Frank Sinatra. Elvis Presley, right? Elvis Presley. Tender. Yeah. (laughs) You know, the, you know, the, the drifters, the temptation, like these fifties stuff. And then, and then suddenly some, suddenly it must've been in the very, like the mid nineties satellite karaoke happened. Right. Mm -hmm. And once the satellite karaoke got, got installed now, suddenly, this is still pre-internet. Now suddenly these little establishments have these libraries of songs, including like sometimes 50, 100, two, 300 Western songs. So yeah. now you have this whole selection that you can actually sing to. But when you're out there in the countryside or wherever you are, me and Neil, we've talked about this before. Why do you want to sing Western songs when you're in Japan, right? I mean, we do, but what about the local music? Shouldn't we be getting into Japanese pop or Japanese music? Because frankly, there's a lot of really good stuff out there, right? And once you have your song, the thing you know, thing you do, and 
when you go to those karaoke boxes, the great thing is you have time to practice, right? So after a little while, you get good at them, or most people do, and you get a go-to song. What's it called when it's like, there's that go-to, you always go, that, that one song? Juhatiban. Juhatiban. The number 18, I think. Whatever the number they call 18. It. <laughs> so what's your, what's your Juhatiban, uh, Neil? What's your number 18? Oh, man. So I, I just want to say, so I've learned, you know, I've learned Japanese and Chinese, and I spend time traveling around Asia. To me, music is what's helped me learn foreign languages. Mm -hmm. So my before my junior abroad in Beijing, I was in Taiwan and I was I was buying cassette tapes of local artists. I'd go in the record store, I'd hear something that sounded okay, I'd go, hey, who's that? And I would read the lyrics, right? Then I did went to Beijing, did the same, went to Japan, did the same. So what's really cool is that in Taiwan and China at the time, the music was a little bit more like pop and ballad. When I went to Japan, there was already, I mean, you had Southern All-Stars back then yeah. already that had been popular since the late 70s, but you started to have like a true indie rock movement. And I think of bands, well, I think of like Spitz and Mr. Children and mm -hmm. music and Mr. Children, there's a video where he looks like Elvis Costello in the video. I mean, his music is really inspired by EC. It's so, fantastic. So yeah, so there's a lot more commonality with, with Western music. And um, yeah, I don't think, you know, I just enjoy I listen to the music so much that I don't practice in a kawaii box. I probably should practice, but <laughs> you know, there is a juhachiban I have, which is, is enka, because enka. I always like to freak people out. There's the a real traditional Japanese, yeah, uh, like salary man music. Probably yeah, more there's a, you know, from a the guy 40s named, and 50s. a yeah. guy named a Toba Ichido Ooh. and a song called Kamome no Uta. And when I bring this out, it the just- The seagull song? Yeah, Kamomei it's a seagull Uta. song, the cry of the seagull or whatever. Yeah. It's like do enka. It's like really deep enka. And I just love, I just love to freak people out. Look, you know, I, I get the looks you, on their faces. You, you got a couple of bars you can sing for us? Uh, that, acapella? So, We're doing acapella so here on the podcast. kaze yo fuke. <laughs> you get the picture. Oh, man. <laughs> it's awesome. That and is sweet. Recently, yeah, recently, like one o'clock. Mm -hmm. Um, and they have like English and Japanese, wherever you are, you're always on my mind. And they mix in the Japanese. That's, that's another good one. But anyway, I'll let you that's go. That's a cool one. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's awesome. My, mine, um, mine was always, uh, I, had, I had to go through these phases in Japan, you know? And when I first got there, like Shima Uta from The Boom was really was really Oh popular. yeah, that's a beautiful song. Shima Uta yokaze ni nori. That one, right? Nice. Um, but I've ultimately settled on this, I heard this music from this guy named Okuda Tamio. Do yep. you know Okuda Tamio? Yeah, I, do. I mean, of course, a lot of Japanese guys do. That, right? I, you know, there's one song that really influenced my drumming, by the way. Um, a rock song. Maybe it's the one you're thinking. Well, that's, that's, that's a song. I love that's a that great song. song. Yeah. That's a great song. Yeah, it's a great song. But I, but first, Okuda Tamio, like he, he produced some really big bands. Like Americans might even know Puffy. There was a cartoon called Puffy, right? Uh, they, they turned into a cartoon, and Puffy was his band that he that he produced. Um, really interesting, cool, like kind of- Osaka like, natives, by the way. All Osaka natives, all, like all the good entertainment really comes out of Osaka, I'll admit that. Um, but my favorite, my very, very favorite Japanese song of all time is an Okuda, Okuda Tamiyo acoustic. That's, well, it's not really acoustic, but it's, um, it's acoustic led. It's called Sun, Musko. And mm -hmm. um, it's about you know, his advice, I think, at least my, my loose interpretation, the advice that he's given his boy to how to be a man. And it's just- I, it, it it gets me every single time. It starts off with just a couple couple chords. You know, it's really like, yeah. Neil's Neil's shaking his head. I don't know if you guys out there are thinking we're nuts, but um. I was just going to start holding a rhythm here with the. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, look, that that music just among, you know, all the different music that we've listened to over time. I tell you, I love, I love going to Japan and just doing, you know, getting into some karaoke. And um, yeah, I agree. And nobody, there is no other podcast guest I've had. Um, and, you know, I'll probably dig into some of my Japan connects at some point, but I mean, there's no other podcast guest I've had who would sit here and do some on the spot karaoke. So, yeah, good, good on you, Neil. You're a good sport. Sora mo toberu hazu. Yeah, we could go on and on. And I'm not <laughs> really good with mem I'm not good at memorizing lyrics. But if me I me neither. Yeah, but if I see it on the screen, you know what I mean. But I listen. I listen to a lot of music regularly, and that. That's what oh man, it. and I could go on. Like in fact, with Musuko, like that's all. 
that's all I've got up here. You know, and you were mentioning about learning. I mean, I learned a lot of my written Japanese through karaoke, right? I mean, I spoke mm-hmm. Jap- a little Japanese, but my written Japanese or my reading actually is from a lot of it is from going to karaoke and watching the watching the words light up as you sing them. So, yep. you know, I could do it when I see it. I couldn't couldn't write very well myself, but you know, anyway, I loved it. I loved the social aspect. I loved the whole idea of of uh, you know this. The Japanese really had it right, I think, or they have it right when it comes to creating these social bonds um, and creating these kind of in-person real networks, leveraging their social capital very heavily into their work and their private life. And if you see where I'm going here, I'm trying to kind of steer us a little bit into this whole direction of social, social media, networking things, the things that drew drew us together originally. And I wanted to um, give you the floor for a little while here, Neil, because um, Neil has has re- Neil wrote a book. It's published about six months ago, so we're not saying it's a new book, but it is for, to many people out there. It is a new book, The Age of Influence. Um, it is a tremendous book, especially when it comes to you know inf- influencer marketing, um, which is something that many of you have, have have toyed around with, learned, or played around with. Or some of you might be thinking, um, yeah, influencer marketing. That's the Kardashians. You know, they they, they grab grab a grab a Pepsi and suddenly you know Pepsi sells. Yeah, that is that's a, a kind of influencer marketing, but that's like influencer marketing for CMOs who have like a shit ton of money and don't really think deeply about what influencer marketing really is. Um, I think anyway, I'm sorry about that, whoever that CMO was. But um, really this whole idea of of how we grew up in Japan, essentially professionally, do you think that that led to your your perspective on the human networks and on building human networks and even on influence? Well, definitely, and I won't say it's just Japan because when I worked in China, mm-hmm. and this is you know when I show when I tell people like I you know I set up a sales office for a Japanese semiconductor company in 1995, they go oh Chong, and what it means in Chinese we were so poor back then right, um, but even back then and today as well it's all about something called guanxi which we call mm-hmm. kanke in Japanese, all about connections, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so definitely, you know, doing sales in China and then working, my next job in Japan was with a, a Gaishiken American company selling embedded software and, and really working in an industry where there was an ecosystem of different partners. You had uh, system integrators, you had value-added resellers, you had semiconductor manufacturers, you had other bits of software that we had to play with. And that networking keeping those relationships actually generated leads, which generated sales, which generated commissions, right? Yeah. So, so to me, that's just always been a natural part of business. And probably because I started my career in Japan, I assume you did as well, yeah. Dan. So, so yeah, so that has definitely influenced. I think what's really influenced me being in Japan is the work ethic. And mm-hmm. I'm not talking about karoshi or like, you know, yeah. working yourself to death. I'm saying, hey, if I want to do something, I'm not going to do it half ass. Yeah, it's it's all or nothing, right? So if that means it's nine to five, I'm giving my hundred percent nine to five. After five, I'm giving my hundred percent to my 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 own life, right? Mm-hmm. And in Japan, it sort of blurs because you got overtime and what have you when you work at a big company. But but yeah. take that aside, I I do think that there was a tremendous amount of bonding mm-hmm. when I worked at, especially at the Japanese company. That your first two years, every night you're going out to the pub. Literally, right? And, and, and getting to know your fellow workers. There were always like Enkai, always parties. You know, someone is joining the company, someone's leaving the company. There's something's going on. Um, so yeah, no, there, you, no you communication. To, no communication. You get to lot. You get to know people. So it's a very um, human centric. I mean, the same as you could say the same as everywhere in the world. But in in Asia, I, I mean, especially in Japan, there there was that that combination of that communication with the work ethic mm-hmm. are things that I I take with me today. It's like, you know, Americans that just want to go to Japan and 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 strike it rich. It's like it doesn't happen. You need to develop relationships. You need to tap into those relationships, and that's time. And that's the analogy with social media, right? Yeah. Is that whatever you want to do, it's about developing relationships. You want to work with influencers. It's about relationships. So. That core combination of relationship building and work ethic, I think, has given me sort of a strategic advantage. And now I look at my, I look at my son, 
you know, he's 13, he's in school and he's, and, he, and he's like, uh, you know, he's, he's putting together a timeline of the American revolution and he has these pictures he posted. He has, he's probably listening to me right now and he's going to be pissed after this interview, but, um, and he, he prints out, you know, what happened during the Boston tea party and all this stuff. And then he's like, well, I'm just going to handwrite the dates in on the time. I'm like, why wouldn't you print it out? Like you printed out everything else. I'm like, are you saying that because you're doing your best or are you saying that because you just want a shortcut because you know the Dodger game is starting in a few hours. You want to make sure we're not late for that. So <laughs> for me, it's all or nothing doing my best. And I, I really attribute, I mean, it, it, there's people like that in America as well. Don't get me wrong. But that mm -hmm. seriousness and really that translates to my consulting and, and my speaking and even this podcast, yeah. Dan. It's like, hey, before we start, who's your audience? I want to yeah. serve them. This isn't about me. It's about them. I think that that, you know, the Japanese culture is selfless in a lot of ways, they become, you could say every company is almost a religion, right? Uh, yeah. People just are, are very selfless in their relationship. I think that's changing over time, but a lot of those things have been melted into this unique melting pot that is me, and I'm sure you've you've gotten similar influences. Yeah, totally. It's uh, It's been um, formative to say the least to have had to go out with my Japanese colleagues, you know, arms twisted, Every single night of my life for the first four or five years, I was now the arms twisted part is the only thing that's that's false about that. I mean, I loved that part of the culture, um, and I still do. And and um, I, I believe that uh, experiences in Japan help me to ground myself into in the fact that the connections that we have together are fundamentally human, um, and it is that it, are, it is those human connections, you know, that that power everything forward. And and you know, windmill networking, the reason that we got together, your first book is all about that. It's all about the the connections that, you know, that we make with with people. And and you know when and when we met, I mean this is back in like 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. we didn't have ulterior motives. We no. weren't trying to like sell real estate, become a financial advisor, push some, you know, C B D vitamin. Um, it was just very organic. We we all were mainly business people. We all understood the power of networking and we generally just wanted to get to know each other you know, maybe exchange ideas and, and see where it went. And I, I just wish there was more of that because I see a lot of the networking meetings these days have, have well, turned into something very, very different where everybody has that exterior, you know, the, the ulterior motive as well, the way every, they're there. Everybody has an ulterior motive um, in a lot of situations. Certainly people are out to make a living. Um, some people are out to make a buck. And I think those are two different things. Yeah. And it's the authenticity of the, of, of the motive. It's the intent that really kind of separates people in those kind of situations. I tend to think still that the ones who go to these networking events without the intent of, I'm going to make a sale tonight are the ones that are successful mostly because you know yeah. you want to make authentic relationships. And that's that kind of brings me a little bit to, to this whole idea of influence, you know, where you've really put a stake in the ground, um, being one of the leading influencers yourself, but also being an expert on the idea of influence and on uh, the, the how on influencer marketing, on how to be an influencer, what comprises influence in, in this crazy kind of digital world and even the non-digital side that we have today. You mentioned it before, it's, it's, it's about relationships. And there was one thing from the book that actually kind of stood out for me. And a tremendous book, by the way, and I think I've said that before, but if you haven't bought it, go to Amazon, Age of Influence, Neil Schaefer, um, and you spell his name like you'll see it in this title of the episode. But anyway, um, there's this one quote and it's kind of spoke to something that I talk about a lot, which is how brands try to be human, but can't be or aren't. Um, and you said, uh, if social media is about the convergence of information and communication, brands are at a distinct disadvantage simply because they can't communicate like people. I saw that and it's early in the book, but um, I think everything springs from that one insight and there's lots of insights in there, but how do you think that that's going these days? Like how can brands or how are brands doing better at this? And I realize I'm asking you to open up a little bit about the book and talk about some of the themes, but of course, yeah. what are you thinking about that? I mean, you know, coronavirus has really challenged brands. Yeah. And, you know, just in... April was literally two days after Black Lives Matter start. I'm on a Wharton Business School podcast, mm -hmm. which is a serious XM radio show. And they said, hey, you know, we're also going to ask you about Black Lives Matter. Is that okay with you? <laughs> and it's like, I didn't have a choice in the matter, but sure. you know, but that's if you're a brand, that's what happens, right? I think it was Mike Tyson who said, 
everything smells like roses until you open up the door and you get punched in the face. I mean, <laughs> stuff happens. Yeah. And as a business, you have to respond and you're not a person. And I think the most important thing that I think brands have gotten better at that they realize is they need to be relatable. They can't be people. I mean, they try to, you know, we talk about all these people, here's how to humanize your brand. Well, it's still a brand, it's in it for the money. So you really can't, but you can be more relatable mm -hmm. and you could be more relatable with your messaging and your content. And I think that, mm -hmm. you know, we support the frontline workers or especially in, in the sports industry, we support Black Lives Matter, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's, we, we've seen an incredible amount of companies that have, it, they've put away their marketing and promotion and they focused on the messaging. And I think that's that's great. But at the end of the day, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book is that in the background of all this, you know, the declining organic reach that brands have in social media is only accelerating, right? And the idea is that, you know, brands can't be human. And the reason that people yield more influence is because we generate more, you know, we, we, we relate more to people than we do to businesses. Yeah. Now the businesses have the budgets to be putting out this TV commercials that look all fine and, and what have you. But at the end of the day, when we're on our social networks, unless it's an ad from a brand, we don't see brand content. We see people content. We relate to it. We engage with it. We find new people to follow who are influencers. And that's really the heart of it that, you know, if brands want to continue to be seen in social, they need to become more collaborative. They need to see social media, not as a place for another promotion channel, but really as, a, as an amazing place to collaborate with people, to find people, to find your customers, to find your network, to find your fans, your posse, yeah. to develop new ones, right? And when mm -hmm. you look at it that way, it should hopefully change the perspective. And that's really, you know, I, I look at the age of influences trying to be a disruptive book yeah, because I think businesses are just fighting a battle that they're not going to win. And it, you know, as it becomes more and more pay to play, you know, there, there's danger in having a 100% paid media approach to social media. People distrust ads. I have a, I have a client, their uh, marketing manager, she's a millennial. She's like, we don't want to do ads. It just, it makes us look cheap when we have to advertise. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you, you want to get other people talking about you. And that's really, I mean, social media was all about inciting word of mouth marketing to begin with. That's why it's so attractive. So you really need to retool. And I do believe over time, more people yield more influence. And, um, you know, when you start to collaborate with those people around you that know, know, like, and trust you that have influence, it opens up so many different opportunities. You know, Dan, in my career, I changed jobs twice in Japan. Mm -hmm. So the first time I changed, I had offers from three different companies. So I ended up working with this American high-tech startup. But I also had an offer from Procter & Gamble. Their uh, Asia Pacific headquarters was in Kobe, Japan. Loko Island, actually, really nice yeah. place. And I, they had a, uh, a, a full day interview or a full day sort of session. And Procter & Gamble was really famous at only choosing people very early in their career. I was 29, I was the oldest person there. Mm. And they put us into groups and you know a few of the marketing people were there. And I, I got an offer and I went in for the interview. They wanted me to promote Bounce, that product that you put in, sure. the, uh, in the dryer in Japan, a country where they don't use a lot of, of dryers. Any dryers. But, yeah, but it was on the increase. <laughs> I'm like, well, what does my job entail? They go, well, you know, you have a lot of budget for user focus groups and you, you talk to housewives, which in this case is the target audience, and you find out you know, how we can develop a product that meets their needs. How do they think about our current product? And, and it, I mean, it's basically product marketing, right? Yeah. That user focus group is out there in social media for any business. So think of all the budget you spend on user focus groups that you can oh, yeah. apply, right, to, to people and think that they might be able to help in amplifying your content and in creating content. Yeah. And if there's a crisis in helping you out because they're your fans and friends. I mean, there's just so many good things that I think come out of this. And you know what? Stop creating content. I mean, I'm not saying to stop like text content, what have you, like blogs, but, you know, stop creating visual content. Just repurpose the content of your fans, right? Yeah. And, and, and it just, it makes sense. And so, but so few people get it because when they hear, hear the word influence, they cringe. Fire well, Festival, people I don't know that have 10 million followers, they're charging, who are, and they, they don't get it. So I'm on a mission to sort of re-educate marketers because yes. they've been misled, they've been miseducated. Well, I mean, there's, to be fair, there are some big influencers that people know about are um, celebrities or, or people who have become- Celebrities. Celebrities because of their influence for no other reason. 
Yeah. Um, you have now with, of course, with TikTok, you have this whole a whole generation totally. of people who are TikTok famous, but not famous anyplace else necessarily. But it, that's that crossover is definitely happening. Uh, certainly for the largest, for the people with the largest followings uh, um, and the millions and millions of followers, and you know who, who are going who are on you know are now cross path platforming. Mm-hmm. But fundamentally, what you in your book you break down, you know, you break down the influencer to these to from the mega influencer down to the to the micro and the nano influencer, and. Um, I think it's really important for communicators and marketers out there to understand that sometimes the most effective way to reach your intended audience, and of course you need to know who those people are first, but sometimes the most effective way to reach that intended audience is, is with an army of people who each have 500 to 1,000 followers. Those are influencers too. I mean, you're an influencer, Neil, for, you know, for years and years. You, you're, you're up in that, in that kind of higher level there of the mega influencer, I think, but you know, especially within social media circles and among social media marketers. And by the way, listeners, you know, if you ever want to see who the influencers are, like the, the, um, the people who I think are, um, have their raving fans, um, go to social media, media marketing world one time in your life. Mm. Uh, and, and it's really, it's really great because Neil, who is my friend and was my friend before social media marketing world, I see him at social media marketing world and he's a celeb man and deservedly so, but it's really great. Like kind of walking around because I get the coattail effect. You know that guy? Yeah, I know. <laughs> sure, I do. We're going out to dinner drink, later. Dan. We're going out to dinner later, but you can't come. Sorry. <laughs> I, I trade on the ad influence. I mean, that's that's another thing that you cover in the book is trading off on influence. But, but that's the thing, Dan. I mean, I, yeah. I look at so you know you're a podcaster now. Yeah. Maybe you get well. Okay, you're in the book. I talk about the ninety nine one one rule, right? Mm-hmm. How many internet users are there right now in the world? Maybe maybe a billion. I don't know. Probably more than that. Uh, Probably more like, than that, right? Yeah. How, how, how many, many? How many smartphones are there? Yeah, like three many, billion. Yeah. How many podcasts exist? Do you know the total number of podcasts that exist? So I read Pod News. Okay, so the so answer you know. is yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, and it's uh, one point four million right now. I think is the latest, the latest figure. One point four million out of one billion. You, my friend, by the nature of have, by being a content creator and getting content out there, you are now in the top one percent. As am I. And what Hell gets yeah. really interesting is. As you begin to podcast, you get, you know, 10 downloads per episode, 50 downloads per episode, 100, 250, and you're like, why can't I get more? And I, and I think, how many small businesses out there, when they publish a blog post, do they get 250 hits in that blog post within 30 days? Yeah. It, it's hard work, right? So you begin to see the supply and demand that the content creators win, Right. And it could be podcasting, it could be YouTube, it could be a blog. Mm -hmm. Um, You become one of, and then, well, if I want to try to reach an audience and I want to promote my product, what do I do? And then people are going to start pinging you, Dan. Love your podcast. We know you serve a community of marketers. We have a product we think they'd be interested in. Can I be on your podcast? And that's, and so you are an influence. When other people want to tap into your influence, you are an influence. And that can happen if any one of you have ever had someone reach out and say, can I link to, you know, can I guest blog for you and get a link back to my site? Can I be on your podcast? Will you interview me for your blog? Or, you know, for, can we do an Instagram live together? Whatever it is, or a brand reaches out to you saying, hey, we'll, we'll give you a free product if you post for us. You are now entering that level because not everybody is at that level. Not everybody yeah. has a thousand followers. Not everyone's creating content. And that's, that's what you need to realize. I mean, my publisher, Harper Collins, when I, I said, how do I promote the books? Should I do tra- traditional media outreach? They said, no, reach out to podcasters and bloggers. And I was just on a, a, a PR podcast today mm-hmm. where the woman said, yes, we consider podcasts and bloggers media. Uh, the media yeah. database is like, you know, decisions of the world. They don't necessarily cover podcasters. But, and I get pitched by PR, you know, companies on, be, uh, on behalf of other companies and, and executives, what have you. So this is the new media, right? Yeah. And, Digital uh, influencers are the influencers in in digital media. Well, so, I, I I do like to think I'm on the cutting edge of this whole thing. I mean, I, I realize I, I spoke to um uh, to some podcasters who are like, yeah, well, you should, really should have done it five years ago if you really wanted to be somebody somebody big. But you know, hey, keep it up, <laughs> you know. But that's okay. I you know I I am in this for the love of it um, because I had to. Like I really felt like I, I felt compelled. I felt like I had to. And I think that was really true, more true for the first seven or eight episodes where it's like, you know, where there's a compulsion. Um, now, 20 episodes in, this will, and, and I think that we're going to be 23 or 24, Neil, by the time this goes out. Now that many in, 
I feel like it's it's becoming a a refined, more refined art. I guess I'm maybe I'm flattering myself a little bit, but I feel like it's definitely reaching a a, a, a more skilled level, um, a place where um, I'm I'm a little bit more directed and intentful as I do this. Not that I wasn't before, and like I said, every one of my guests, I love them. I think I stand by them, and I would I would do that episode again in a heartbeat. I think that it's just really I'm seeing more of the potential in it. And there's um there's a guy I want to give a shout out to actually. Uh, are you familiar with uh, with Billy Samoa Sal- uh, Salibi by chance? I'm not. So Billy just started um, a a podcast, and I'll I'll send you the link, Neil, but uh, or you can just look it up. He started a podcast called For the Love of Podcast. And his very first guest was Jordan Harbinger. And he's he's had now, you know, whatever, half dozen guests, and they're all like hall, hall of, podcast hall of famers, whatever that necessarily is right now, but people like who have ser- built serious followings, who uh, like the CEO of Blueberry, for example, was on there the other day. Okay. And Billy's just a great guy. Anyway, um, the point of it all is that that it's now still an industry that's way, 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 way early, but in terms of its capacity to wield influence is limitless, I think, at this point. And I didn't start it thinking that, is what I'm saying. Like, I didn't start this thinking I'm going to wield influence. Now I'm thinking, if, I, if I'm wielding influence, then that gives me some responsibility, doesn't it? Right? So I have to think what all that means. I don't, I'm, it's all kind of, the, 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 uh, the hamster's running real fast in the head. I don't we're, know. We're in the middle of an election, too, so it gets sort of tricky, too. but yeah. yeah. That, too. But, like, you know, it's it's... I also know that it's a long game. I know that it's not a it's not a quick turnaround. I know that you know year or two in, that's when I'll really know, um, and that's fine. But you know, you have built a kind of media empire for yourself. I mean, you have through your hard work. I mean, and I've witnessed it grow from the beginning. It's been fantastic to watch this and inspirational. And also, um, sometimes I take a lot of pointers from you, man. You've got Thanks. you've got your website, so you've got neilshafer.com. Uh, you have your agency, PDCA. Plan to check act people, PDCA social. Uh, you have you're on book four or is it book three? It's that was my fourth book. I'll be fourth book, right? Starting my fifth book. Maximize your social windmill networking. Uh, LinkedIn. Maximizing LinkedIn for sales and social media marketing. In between, right. in between, and then yeah. and then maximize your social, and then the age of you know age of influence. You've been like basically building your influence brick by brick. So I was going to ask you like, so how, how did you do it? But I think you know the answer. You're just going to say, like, you worked your ass off at it. But is there? Can you give us some some ideas about, like, how you went around get it getting to be, like, understanding the path that you wanted to go, how you got to be known, et cetera. I'll leave it there. Yeah, I didn't, you know, intend for any of this to happen. I mean, I, I came back from Japan. We had a baby girl. Thought it best to raise, you know, start a family here in the U.S. Came back. And I had no network here because I built my network in Japan and in, in, in China. Uh, most of my friends, we ended up moving to uh, an area where there's a lot of Japanese that I didn't know anybody in. And all of my friends from high school or college were in different parts of the country. So it just started organically that, you know, I got to build a network for my next job. And LinkedIn was the natural answer. But yeah. I really enjoyed the networking. And I enjoy, I really had a unique perspective on LinkedIn back in 2008 because I looked at it as a business tool. My, my business background gave me that perspective. And I was very open where most people were closed. So I started you know, participating in LinkedIn groups. LinkedIn Answers was awesome back in the day. LinkedIn groups were very organic right. and authentic back in the day. And I'd connect with a lot of people. And I'd say, hey, let me answer any LinkedIn question you have. And then when I got the job... Right, I decided that I'm going to launch a blog, which I did through LinkedIn as well. They used to have a WordPress.com app. I'm going to launch the blog, and I'm just going to use it as a way to network with people, right? Because I I know that that's going to be that's going to be you know digging your well before you're thirsty that that approach and, and paying it forward. So I did that. And lo and behold, three and a half months later, uh, this company pulled the plug on me. Oh. So um, what I didn't realize though, and and that's what started my whole journey, right? And and where I realized I needed to create something that no one, no business can take away from me. And that's your personal brand. And I, I think a lot of people are facing that today for the first time. And I, yeah. I, it's tough. I went through it twelve years ago, but you know the key thing here is that I was early without knowing it because I self published a book back in two thousand nine. Today, oh my God, it's it's so easy to self publish a book. Back then, there weren't that many books on LinkedIn, right? Yeah, there weren't that many blogs on LinkedIn. In fact, I'll never forget. LinkedIn came out with, man, I'm forgetting the name 
um, of the, it was like LinkedIn today. It was like this news. Was this uh, before Pulse? This is before Pulse. They had something mm-hmm. called LinkedIn today, which mm-hmm. was like curated news. And I remember thinking, I'm going to be first to market with this because I just saw it like on my screen and I beat Mashable by two hours, right? I mean, they <laughs> nice. ended up getting a heck of a lot more traffic than I did, I'm sure. But these are the things where, you know, it was, it's supply and demand. And there was a huge demand with little supply, whether it was my book or this blog on LinkedIn, which then became maximized social as, as I went beyond LinkedIn, so did my blog and my branding. And, you know, I've built this authority. And what you what happens is over time, you build authority. Mm-hmm. Google sees you've been doing this for a long time. You get more backlinks. Podcasts, you know, people, they hear about you. They see an episode. They end up downloading all your episodes when they subscribe. And that, that feeds the algorithm. And if you open yourself up to be interviewed, whether it's a podcast, with, when people reach out to you, but also just, you know, just showing up and being public, right? I think that's really the key thing. But at the heart of it, it's the formula that I tell people in the book, right? It's being active in social and creating content. And it's normally around a niche. My original niche was LinkedIn. Now it's, it's you know, digital social media marketing in general. I mean, I do a lot of influencer marketing, but it's not just that. Mm-hmm. And it, it's consistency. And it's also listening to my audience when they, you know, when they hint at what their needs are and creating content around that. I mean, the age of influence served a need because I was getting asked questions about influencer marketing and I didn't find the right answers myself. And I knew that there was a connection with celebrity endorsement. I knew there was a connection with blogger outreach, with affiliate marketing, with employee advocacy and social selling. And I wanted to put that all together. And and that's what I I believe I did with the age of influence. So it's really a combination of all of that. And I think if you're trying to become an influencer, you miss the point. Because if you really wanna make a seven figure income from being an influencer, good luck, right? But the process is the same. You need to be you need to be focused on a subject. You need to be constantly creating content. You need to be engaging, right? And you need to get yourself out there. And anybody can do it, but it takes time. It takes expertise and experience. And most of all, Dan, the reason why you are one of the 50% of podcasts that went beyond their 10th episode is because you have passion. Yeah. And I have the passion. And if you're not passionate about doing it, it's not going to last. Yeah. I'm beginning to get a little less passionate about the editing process. I will be honest with you on this. Oh, you got to outsource that ASAP. E- eventually, but you know, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm having a, a lot of fun with it um, because I use Audition, and and you know, all the Audacity people out there are probably going to say like, "Why are you using Audition?" But I like Audition, and you know, I don't mind paying a little bit for it. But I really like when I have it on the screen and I'm like hard at hard at work doing my kind of sound technician stuff, and my daughter walks in and says, and says, "Ooh, what you doing, Dad?" You know. Because I got all these like really cool sound graphs going on on the screen, and you know all these analyses. I look really it, it's it's a it looks a lot better than you know a PowerPoint for a marketing presentation. Like all this really cool shit happening. Um, but my, that aside, uh, yeah. it, it does. My audio editing software. Her name is Becky. Thanks. And I swear by her. And yeah, I just there's so little time in the day, and we have families as well. Yeah. And so much to do that if you really want to become more influential, you got to scale that influence and scale the content creation. Yeah. And at some point, you're going to start to outsource, oh. hire people to do these little things for you. Unless you really, if you really enjoy doing them, that's awesome. No, I, mean, I don't. So it's, it's a cottage industry at this point for me. And, and I'm okay with that. And I think you will notice if you go back to episode one and go now to episode 20 something, the sound, the difference in sound is first of all, night and day. Um, and I, part of that is because I got better at the editing. Mm-hmm. Um, but a large part of that is because I discovered a couple of cheats and I, and I was able to, you know, create, well, basically import a whole series of settings for audition that sound amazing. Like the other Photoshop thing that presets, I, presets, right? Yeah, some presets. Yeah. The other thing that I, that I learned, um, is the microphone matters a lot. Yeah. And you were talking about this, um, on your, on your recent, um, on one of your recent podcasts, where, by the way, I love that recent podcast where you're talking about podcasting because it, it because you were just about to come on here and I'm like, what? Think about the timing about this whole <laughs> yeah. thing. We're talking about podcast. You were using a Yeti Nano, or are you still using the the? No, uh, I'm Yeti? using the Rode. You're using podcaster. the Roadster. So I went from the hundred dollar mic to the two hundred dollar mic, basically. Yeah. So I started off with a with a blue Yeti, which mm-hmm. basically everybody has. Still a great mic. Great mic. Um but picks up every single sound within five miles. And if yep. you're not in a studio, which I'm not, 
it doesn't make sense. Yep. So, you know, I live in a home with two teenage girls and I don't think my listeners want to hear uh, my kids FaceTiming with their friends in the background of a podcast when they're, and they're like 20 feet away through, through a wall. On the other hand, this one, the ATR 2100, um, the um, Audio Technica is the other big podcasting mic. And it, for Indeed a reason, it it's, I think it sounds fantastic, but I also know that there's going to come a point where I'm going to say, uh, you know what, I think I need to trick out my studio a little bit and, um, you know, go for some upgrades here and there. But I'm pretty satisfied with the way it sounds right now. Now, you know, my next step is obviously to find a, a really good way to edit these in a, in a way that isn't taking all my time. But you know what? It's, it's my labor of love right now. I'm, could, I'm good with it until I build up to a point where, you know, where I'm able to do that, I will do that. And these are $100 marks, everybody. And, and yeah. you know, you, and either of those are great. Um, you know, I did an interview with a guy. <laughs> he had a Shure microphone, right? Oh, nice. Like one of those three, four hundred. Yeah, he goes, Neil, I, I love, you know, I, I love your, your mic. What is it? I, he goes, it sounds better than mine. And I look up his mic, it costs $800, right? Oh. So at, at some point it's overkill, but I think yeah. the 100 to 200, the 100 to 300 is, and, and that's where the, the editor is the one who said, your Yeti Nana sucks, Neil. You got to get a new one. She gave me, you know, she, she mentioned the audio technique as well. Mm -hmm. She goes, if you really want to get the best one that I recommend, it's, it's this Rode podcaster. Podcaster. And now I know she loves to edit my podcast. I got this like, Neil, you sound amazing, warm, crisp, Do. like a, a friendly tone. So yeah, that's where having a, a third party set of eyes yeah. really helps. Your podcast about podcasts is, uh, you know, is what made me think of Billy, but it also got me in mind of how I'm doing mine. And I thought, you know, check, 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 check. I'm kind of like, well, I'm awesome. following a lot of what, what Neil is talking about. Um, so I, I know that I'm on the right track if, if you're saying the things that I'm doing and, uh, that's, that's always a lot of fun. And so I, so I, I loved getting, get a little geeky with you on that, but anyway, go, just to go back a little bit to, to the idea of, um, how you built your business that is Neil Schaefer, your personal brand. You talked about influence. You talked about, you know, the age of influence as, as part of, you know, what, where you've, where you've been and filling up, filling that need, but you've identified a lot more needs now. And, um, the age of influence is obviously part of that. So influence, influence marketing, um, being an influencer yourself, let, let's, let's separate that out or kind of subsume it into a greater piece. So into like, as one of the prongs of a many pronged strategy or a many pronged brand or whatever. So like knowing that in, influencer, influencer marketing, being an influencer, becoming an influencer, et cetera, is just one part of the puzzle. What are the other parts of the puzzle that you're really working on right now? And that, you know, that you think a could be integrated with should be integrated with influencer marketing. And by the way, I think everything is probably integrated at some level. But you know, what are the things that you think are the most important to be focusing on? Um, and what is that bigger pie looking like right now? Yeah. So I, uh, you know, I I did social media strategy consulting since January two thousand ten, and it was really a Japanese client, a startup that they were really their their first service was focused on the American market. And I helped them with the social media strategy consulting. And then they said, Neil, we'll, we don't have any resources here. Will you just do this for us? And that's what, that's what launched this agency. And a few years ago, I had quite a few Japanese clients that I helped them with. Over time, though, you know, the success of the agency is my approach has always been, I'm gonna, I'm, it's not a black box. I'm going to be hand in hand with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you. I'm going to train you what I do. And a lot of the companies have found some success. They've hired their own internal teams. And my role has become more of an advisory consultant role, which I don't mind at all, right? Yeah. So- you know, what I noticed with coronavirus was I've, I've never been busier. And the business has come not from the agency side, but really from what I call fractional CMO. Mm -hmm. It's or an outsourced CMO or outsourced director of marketing. It's really filling the need of bringing in someone. And it's not based by project. It's really, you know, now that we're all work from home, now I'm showing up in a Zoom video right? As an external consultant, but I'm working together with, with marketing teams and sometimes directly with the CEO on, on marketing initiatives. And you combine that with the fact that with coronavirus, you must meet your customer digitally. Mm -hmm. You have no choice. So it's really interesting seeing some Japanese companies trying to play catch up on the digital transformation. 100%. You know, <laughs> Cause they were so far, especially B2B, as you know, so far behind. And I had you know, I had people reaching out to me saying, Neil, um, 
I want to do influencer marketing. I want to do what you did in your book, right? I, okay, let's take a step back. So my, my B2B sales background, when you married salespeople, you need to dumb things down. You need to make it really simple. Um, salespeople are, are creative. They're, they're artists. I love them. But if you want to reach sales goals, you need to be very clear and concise and simple in the instructions, what I found, which has helped me. So when I dumb it all down, right? If you're going to meet the digital consumer, what does that mean? How are people, when people are online, what are they doing? They're either searching for information. They're, they are still reading emails. And this is the fight I get into with a lot mm -hmm. of Japanese marketers. I but know. They, they are still reading emails. <laughs> and now obviously, you know, they're all saying, oh, well, we invested in HubSpot. It's like, well, I, I can, I, I'm going to, I'm going to get off that. And then the third one, obviously is social, right? Mm -hmm. And, and that's it. Everything that you do digitally can be one of these three things. Search, but email, with, social. Yep. Search, email, social. But within each of, each of these, there's a lot going on. There's obviously with each of these, especially with, with search and social, you have an organic side, you have a paid side, right? Mm -hmm. And content sort of permeates all three. Influence permeates, well, the social, it permeates the biggest, but it's also, it could be important on the search side mm -hmm. and it, it could be important as well on that email side. So I believe what, what I've done is, you know, hey, Neil, what about the influence? Like, okay, let's take a step back, right? There's four major types of content that you can be creating digitally. Yeah. You got your blog, which is what most companies do. Most companies get that today. But where most companies fail is obviously if you have something visual, like a photograph, you have, that's for social media, right? Mm -hmm. And not just Instagram. I mean, every social network supports and promotes photography, but think Instagram. And then you have your video, which is YouTube. And then you have your audio, which is podcast. So what's it going to be? And if you're already doing your blog, well, where else can you meet the digital consumer? So, the, and, and that really came from my influencer marketing perspective, which is where are you going to tap into influencers? Where do they exist? It's not just people taking photos on Instagram. It's YouTubers, it's bloggers, it's, it's podcasters, right? Yeah. So at the end of the day, every company needs their own unique digital recipe. And it's going to have a lot of different elements. And whenever I, I consult with companies, this is sort of, you know, I'm trying to find that unique digital recipe. I'm trying to help them do better what they're already doing, but find gaps in areas that they're not doing that they should be doing based on their unique target market and, 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 what, and their product and service. I'm a cook. I'm, I'm cooking up a digital recipe, a digital marketing recipe with all these different elements. And I consider social media marketing part of digital marketing, right? And, sure. and I, this is what I learned in Japan. You say you're a social media marketing consultant, they, they think you're smoking something. You say that you're a digital marketing consultant, they start to take you seriously. So <laughs> I learned Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Right? So it, it mm. requires a unique recipe to meet the digital first consumer. And that is the book that I want to write if, to help more playbook oriented, more mm -hmm. broad, but really bringing in performance marketing, content marketing, influencer marketing, all these different content, mediums, search, email, marketing automation, bringing it all together into one book where if you're not skilled in some areas, you can dive in. If you're already skilled, you'll find other areas that you might be missing and really sort of a best practices playbook, but all given with that Neil Schaefer perspective, which is very holistic yeah. and no fluff. <laughs> um, you know, more along the lines of a maximize your social type of book, but that is, that is what I envision for this book. Because when you read the age of influence, it's about more than just influencer marketing. I talk about yeah. social media marketing. I talk about all these elements. So it's really bringing that forward onto its own stage. And I think that is the book that the market needs, especially the smaller the business, the more they need it. Right. Yep. So yeah, I'm really excited about that. And I'll be uh, quarantining myself in a hotel room for two weeks in Tokyo and in, in Gotanda of all places. <laughs> oh my so, God. Like, <laughs> eating a kombini food uh, three times a day for two weeks. We'll see if I lose or gain weight. Uh, the uh, the high chews uh, in the evening will probably make me gain weight. But yep. um, yeah, I'm really, and I think that is, that that's what the book, that, that's what the world needs. And I'm really, that's where my passion is, is to be able to, to dumb it down so that everybody who reads it can create their own unique concoction, their own unique recipe of all these elements. I love that. Neil's digital cookbook. You heard it I'll here. Be, I'm going to be fully garbed out and, and, you know, like the French cook, like you see in the in nice French restaurants in Tokyo, you know, the, the it's garb. Gonna, it's going to get some Michelin stars. Uh, That's what I'm hoping. I'm certainly, uh, I'll certainly support it, but I mean, I can't wait for it. I think it's going to be, uh, as, as your other books are, eminently readable, absolutely applicable, practical, and um, disruptive, um, as, as you had set out to be with Age of Influence, just making sense of 
what is kind of chaotic to a lot of people. I think if you can do that, if you can make sense out of chaos, you are serving a very important role, um, especially in this crazy world we live in now. And you know, just to go back a little bit, something you said where you've been busier than ever since COVID-19 hit um, and um, this whole digital transformation thing, look, there, we can go on forever about that. I certainly have talked about how it changed my life and really gave me the perspective I needed to push the damn button, as Brian Fanzo says. And, you know, I'm not turning back. I, I'm, I'm very excited and a little bit trepidatious, I think, about where this journey is going, but I'm, I'm cool with it. Uh, but, you know, something you were saying about, about Japanese companies and like a lot of companies trying to make these digital transformations, I just had an observation real quick, you know, and it's a very simple one. And I realize I'm sort of rolling into something I think sounds big, but it's not. My observation is this. People need to learn how to use a pair of headphones. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was on a Zoom call today and I've been on Zoom calls whenever there's more than three people on a, or maybe it was a WebEx, I don't know, but whenever there's more than three people on these calls, right? Internal mics are not your friends, people. They're not. Yeah, it's true. Especially when you are using external speakers. And you hear people yelling, mute it, mute it, mute it, Jim. <laughs> Everybody should be equipped. Every company now, every single one should shell out 20 bucks and get everybody a cheap pair of headphones at least. And if they don't like the cheap ones, they go buy their own. But get everybody a, a, a pair of headphones that hardwire into your PC, right? Not everybody needs a $100 mic, but at least a pair of headphones. My rant is over. That's, that, that's, my, <laughs> that's my big complaint of the day. But look, Neil, I am, as always, inspired and you know partially astounded by the amount of stuff that you're doing. The fact that you're even able to take a little bit of time to come and talk with me. I know that you've done over 100 podcast episodes this year, including your own, but, uh, but certainly all the interviews you've been doing, some of that for your book, some of that just because, like guys like me, your friends, people you know, um, I know you pay it forward. I know that you know, you're just that type of guy. Um, I also knew that when you come on here, we would have a really great conversation and a very valuable one for my listeners, some of whom are probably your listeners too, but a very small number. I'd, I'd venture to say that overlap is real small. I'm really uh, in your debt as always. And I just want to thank you for, for coming. So before you go, is there anything that you would have liked me to have asked you, but I didn't ask you? Well, first of all, the respect is mutual, my friend. I've seen your career and what you've done over the past decade and the, the various paths that you've gone down. Um, and yeah, uh, to see you starting this podcast, I think is really, and I know it's the beginning of a lot of great things to come. So I'm really, I'm really excited for that. Thank you. My um, I mean, yeah, for all those people that live in Japan that do marketing in Japan, that's a whole other podcast episode. <laughs> um, we could go on and on about that. I, I have like a ton of questions that we didn't even get to the beginning of, which, gives, which is awesome because it means you have to come back. You know. Oh, and when I have my um, next book, I will. That's oh, right. absolutely. That's yeah. But um, no, I mean, I think we covered a lot of stuff. I I just say, you know, just like in 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 Japan, you need well, you don't need, but people consume content very very differently there than they do here. Traditional media is still relatively strong. People still read in the trains. Um, it's it's a little bit different. It's not it's not as you know, social. The role of social media isn't advanced as it is here, although Line as an app is yeah. extremely advanced. But when it comes to outside of Japan, and this is the problem, this is a, a slide I usually show when I'm in Japan, is the amount of time spent on social media every week. It is way lower than any other Asian country. So, yeah. you know, if you're a Japanese company, listen to Dan, listen to myself, take our advice, because it's gonna help you not only in the United States, I know a lot of Japanese companies are really invested in Southeast Asia as they see that as the next Europe. Mm -hmm. If not, it may already be the next Europe. Um, the, you know, Japan is very unique in many ways. And I know a lot of Japanese will nod their head, mm -hmm. which means you are challenged now to be able to figure out how the rest of the world does marketing. Because it is going to be different, right? Always. And we're giving you, we're giving you the keys of the kingdom. Um, you know, hire Dan, uh, <laughs> ask him for his expertise. But seriously, it is different. But that those are the things that I think you need to learn. So 
you know, keep my, my only advice is keep listening to Dan. Ah, um, love you it. know, I have, a, I have a podcast as well. There's a lot of great podcasts out there. There's a lot of great blogs, you know, keep learning. Right. And, you know, in the time of COVID-19, when we're working from home, it's a little bit harder to sort of maybe justify our salaries or prove our value that we need to do on a daily basis. So use this as an opportunity to really brush up on your skills. And this is something a lot of Japanese can, yep. can attest to, you know, where we're sort of always sharpening our knife as, as, as marketers, as business people. And now is this, it's more important than ever to do that today because guess what? The number one skill right now might just be digital marketing. I mean, every digital marketer I know is busy as heck. So it's it's the worst of times, it's the best to use, take this time and use it as an opportunity to get ahead in your career. You heard it there, folks. That is is great advice. It's what I have my team doing. I think that you know we need to be learning. One of the things about this podcast is every time I have a guest on, I'm learning. It's my way of studying. It's sort of a cheat. I'm sorry. Neil's been educating me tonight on a few things, um, as you know, as he always does. And if you want to know anything more about Neil, you can visit him at neilshafer.com. All of his social accounts, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera, are all at Neil Schaefer. And uh, don't forget to give Neil a listen at the Maximize Your Social podcast, which is really excellent. And with that, I am pleased as punch. Thank you again, Neil. Thank you very much for coming on. Hey, thank you, my friend. If you enjoyed this episode of The Dan Nessel Show, please head on over to iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or the podcast player of your choice to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. And please don't forget to spread the word. Thanks for listening.